Welcome to the latest episode of British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, the podcast for people who understand that history shows us what's possible for us in our lives today. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd, your host and tour guide as we travel back in time. We're shaking up history to look at the stories that don't always make the history books, to consider famous and infamous characters in new and interesting ways, and to look for all the things that we share even when we're living in different times and places. I hope you enjoy this journey through the royals, rebels, and romantics of Britain. Now, let's explore history together. Hello. For today's journey to the past, we are going to learn how one woman was Queen Consort of France, Queen Consort of England, Royal Prisoner, and queen mother of one of the best and one of the worst kings of England. It's time to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine. A while ago, when the musical Hamilton was taking the world by storm, one of the things history geeks like me did was wonder if we could find another historic character with such a wonderfully lyrical name as Alexander Hamilton. Of course, we found one. Eleanor of Aquitaine. My name is Eleanor of Aquitaine. In France and England will I reign. Just you wait. Just you wait. Right? If anyone out there wants to collaborate with me on a great new musical, just give me a shout. Seriously, though, Eleanor is a fascinating character who refused to be defined by the world and the men around her and who reshaped the politics of France and England throughout the 12th century. She was born in 1122 in what is now southern France and was well-educated by her father, William X, Duke of Aquitaine. She received an education in literature, philosophy, and languages. When her brother died, she became heir to her father's estate and title. Duke William realized that Eleanor would become one of the most eligible women in Europe upon his death. To protect her, the Duke arranged that she be placed under the protection of the King of France at his death. When the Duke died in 1137, the King of France lost no time in claiming guardianship and arranging the betrothal of Eleanor along with her land and wealth to his son. The King sent an escort of 500 men to tell Eleanor the good news and bring her to her new home. Eleanor and Louis were quickly married, and before they had a chance to catch their breath, the King died. So in a few months, Eleanor lost her father, was taken to the French King's court, met and married the king's son, and became queen of France. Now living in Cité Palace in Paris, she was crowned on Christmas Day, 1137. Louis was not meant to be king and had spent his youth training for the church, but his older brother died and he ended up being heir and then king. He was inexperienced, sheltered, especially compared to his intelligent, well-traveled, sophisticated, and flamboyant wife Eleanor. Louis VII's reign was marked by missteps, particularly the massacre of hundreds of innocents taking shelter in a church in the town of Vitry. Louis was racked with guilt and responded eagerly to the Pope's call for a crusade. Eleanor insisted on accompanying Louis on the crusade. Legends have grown up around this unusual decision, to the point where in some stories Eleanor and her ladies are described as being dressed in Amazonian garb and charging around the land. The reality was a bit less dramatic. Eleanor did turn out to be the better leader and encouraged the group to head to Antioch, where her uncle Raymond was expecting them. Eleanor was in her element with Raymond at Antioch, in an environment more like her upbringing, full of charms and luxuries. Louis insisted that Eleanor leave Antioch and accompany him to Jerusalem, dipping the marriage into a place of deep resentment. The crusade was a debacle, and in 1148, Louis and his army were sent home in disgrace. Eleanor had long found life in the French court with her husband, boring. Her husband was sweet-tempered and devout, but not encouraging of her ambitions or interests. Furthermore, Eleanor had failed to give the king a son. The Pope encouraged the couple to reconcile after the crusade fallout, and there was one more pregnancy. When Eleanor gave birth to a second daughter, Louis agreed to her request for an annulment. 
In 1152, Eleanor left her daughters with Louis and departed the French court. She headed for her land in Poitiers, her reputation bruised, but still a huge prize on the marriage market. Her lands were vast, stretching from the Loire to the Pyrenees, with Aquitaine and its rich resources and major trading ports, including Bordeaux and La Rochelle. Just weeks after the annulment was finalized, Eleanor was already married again. She had arranged a marriage with Henry, Count of Anjou, and Duke of Normandy. Henry was the son of Matilda, who had been proclaimed Queen of England, but had been unsuccessful in gaining the throne from her cousin Stephen, who had usurped it. After years of civil war, Matilda and Stephen agreed to a peace treaty that made Henry the heir. So Eleanor traded marriage to the King of France for marriage to heir to the English throne. The English monarchy was in chaos, but once he became king, Henry II was energetic in his efforts to reestablish the power of his grandfather, Henry I. Marriage to Eleanor had greatly increased his land and influence in Europe. The marriage was a series of battles, peppered with his affairs, numerous children, and tempers on both sides. Eleanor was not as easily able to dominate Henry as she had dominated Louis. Even though she was ten years Henry's senior and the experienced ruler, still, she wielded power during her second marriage, particularly over Aquitaine. In addition, during the first fourteen years of their reign, Henry often made Eleanor regent when he left England. Eleanor and Henry had eight children, including four sons who survived childhood. Eleanor realized her power would come through these children, so she focused on them. In 1168, Henry installed Eleanor at Poitiers as Duchess. According to legend, while ruling in Poitiers between 1168 and 1173, Eleanor set up courts of love. It's known that she encouraged a cultural society full of literature, music, poetry, and folklore. The legend goes that Eleanor tapped into the troubadour heritage of her grandfather to attract poets and artists. Perhaps with the help of her daughter Marie, she oversaw a court that promoted chivalry and the practice of courtly love. According to some writers of that time and thereafter, Eleanor, Marie, and other high-born ladies would hold court discussions and discuss whether true love could exist in marriage, what constituted love, and other romantic matters. Whatever the real truth about these courts of love, Eleanor did spend the years apart from her husband and away from the turmoil of her family drama. This came to an end when her sons turned against their father. The oldest son, often referred to as Young Henry, had been crowned before his father's death and set up as a sort of co-ruler. However, Young Henry discovered his father was unwilling to give him any real power. In contrast, Eleanor had empowered younger brother Richard with a great deal of authority in Aquitaine. Young Henry resented his younger brother having more power and authority than he did. In addition, Young Henry had been close to Thomas Becket and may have held his father responsible for Becket's death. In any case, young Henry, supported by his brothers, rebellious barons, and those in France, Scotland, and Flanders, and Eleanor, rebelled against Henry in 1173. The rebellion failed. Young Henry was given two castles and funds to support himself for the rest of his father's reign. Richard and Geoffrey were granted half the revenues from Aquitaine and Brittany. The barons were fined, but restored to their lands. Henry exacted some revenge on William of Scotland, who was forced to sign the Treaty of Falaise. But Eleanor? Although Henry II could forgive his sons and his barons, he could not forgive his wife. Eleanor would be kept under house arrest from 1173 until Henry's death in 1189. The notion of Eleanor of Aquitaine being moved among royal house prisons might remind you of a movie, the 1968 Lion in Winter. Although the background is based on history, the specifics of the film are not particularly accurate. Still, it provides a tempting view of Henry and Eleanor's relationship, at least as created by Catherine Hepburn and Peter O'Toole. In reality, there was a Christmas court held in 1182, not 1183 as the movie portrays, and the king did sometimes have Eleanor join him for these family occasions. While Eleanor was in custody, 
Henry began an affair with a woman thought to have been his great love, Rosamond Clifford, nicknamed Fair Rosamond. There are, of course, rumors that Eleanor trapped Rosamond in a maze at the King's Park at Woodstock and forced her to choose between a dagger and a bowl of poison. In any case, Rosamond died in 1176. In 1183, young Henry became very ill and realized he was dying. Seeking to make amends for his sins, he begged his father to show mercy to Eleanor. When young Henry died, his father summoned Eleanor to Normandy to receive properties that had been given to young Henry. Eleanor stayed in Normandy for six months and began to enjoy greater freedom from this point on. Although still constantly supervised, she sometimes traveled with the king. She wasn't free, but she was more involved in the government. Still, her greatest days lay ahead. After young Henry's death, Richard became the undisputed heir to his father's throne. Reportedly, and likely given their shared affinity for Aquitaine, Richard was Eleanor's favorite son. He became king in July 1189 when his father died. One of his first acts was to to order his mother immediately restored to full freedom. Rather than comfortably retiring in grand style, Eleanor went to work planning Richard's coronation. Eleanor ensured that Richard's coronation was full of pageantry that reinforced his position of King of England, despite the fact that he spent most of his reign in France. She wrote to Westminster and received oaths of fealty from lords and prelates on behalf of the king. Richard had spent so much of his reign out of England that he was generally unknown. Eleanor traveled through the country, establishing alliances and fostering goodwill. Eleanor was the one who had spent all those years in England, and she was able to build on the contacts of hers to strengthen the reign of her son. Eleanor played a large part in Richard's reign. She had known Richard would not resist her policy plans the way his father had. Richard gave his mother power when he left England to participate in the Third Crusade. He was gone from 1190 to 1194, spending the first two years engaged in the crusade and then held in captivity by the Holy Roman Emperor. Eleanor herself traveled to Austria to bring her son home. In recognition of the importance during her son's reign, Eleanor had others address her as, quote, Eleanor, by the grace of God, Queen of England. Although technically she ceased being queen with the death of Henry II, Eleanor probably felt more like a queen during Richard's reign than she had for years. It is largely because of Eleanor's efforts that Richard established his Lionheart reputation. She secured loyalty and admiration for her son through her efforts. Richard died in 1199, leaving his brother John to become king. Now in her 70s, Eleanor refused to slow down. She recognized John's limitations, but she was committed to supporting him in his reign. Early in his reign, John concluded a peace treaty with Philip Augustus, or Philip II of France. Philip was the son of Louis, Eleanor's first husband. Philip had been at war off and on with Henry II since the 1180s, and had had conflicts with Richard as well. The Treaty of Le Goulet was intended to bring peace to Normandy by settling the disputes over boundaries. It was sealed through the marriage between the French House of Capet and the English House of Plantagenet. Eleanor went to Castile and brought back her granddaughter, Blanche of Castile, to marry Philip's son, Louis, who would eventually become Louis VIII. The journey was Eleanor's final international act. She retired to Fontevraud Alley, Abbey, in 1200. But in 1201, when war broke out between John and Philip, Eleanor left the Abbey to prevent her grandson, Arthur, from taking control. Arthur besieged her in the castle of Mirabeau, and John quickly brought troops to defeat Arthur and free his mother. Eleanor returned to Fontevraud, taking the veil as a nun. Her public life was finally complete. Eleanor died in 1204 at approximately 82 years of age, an extraordinary age for a woman of that time. She outlived two husbands, including the one who was 10 years younger than she was. She outlived the three sons who survived childhood, young Henry, Geoffrey, and Richard. She saw two sons on the throne of England. By the time of her death, she had outlived all her children except King John and Queen Eleanor of Castile. During her lifetime, Eleanor was a great patroness of the arts, an example followed by many of her children and grandchildren. 
She had particular interest in and promoted Provençal Romantic poetry, which was popular in her day and came to influence the aristocracy's perception of women. Eleanor wielded power in a time that women were not thought capable of doing so. Her influence was felt in the regions she governed, such as Aquitaine and beyond. She was an influence for upper-class women, particularly her daughters and granddaughters. Eleanor spent her final days at Fontevraud. She is buried between the two men whose reign she helped define. Her husband, Henry II, who expanded his empire and influence through their marriage, and her son, Richard I, whose image as the successful English hero king she helped create. Thank you for joining us to see how Eleanor of Aquitaine rewrote the history of Europe. Join us next time as we take a look at the famous York brothers, Edward IV, Richard III, and George. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time.